They found a skeleton 12 feet tall in California. Wow. Another one was found in Arizona, 12 foot tall skeleton. Here's a human skull that was discovered that is almost twice the size of yours and mine. It's huge. Unbelievable. How about your thumb? You guys got three bones in your thumb. Make sure you guys got all three of them. Um, no, Eric. There are only two bones in your thumb, the proximal phalange and the distal phalange. The bone underneath that is one of your hand bones, or metacarpal. You got all three? There should be a middle one right there, okay? They found a middle human thumb bone to a guy that was three and a half inches long. But Eric, there is no middle thumb bone. Thumbs are the only fingers that lack a medial phalange. Biomajors, back me up. I think it's safe to assume that guy had a big thumb. Yeah. <laughs> probably had a really big hand and was probably really big himself. He was a giant. You're not going to believe me, but in Egypt, they discovered a 47-inch long femur. This picture has long been debunked as a hoax. Why are you still using it, Eric? That's the bone that goes from your hip to your knees. I've got two of them personally, okay? 47-inch long femur. That is impressive. And here's yet another exposed hoax. Honestly, Hovind, how long are you going to keep using falsified evidence to make your case? If your position is so strong, why do you have to resort to such dishonesty? The guy that owned that thing had to be really big. They guess anywhere from 15 to 16 feet tall. So if you ever meet one of his brothers, call him Sir. Or whatever he wants to be called, okay? But don't mess with him. Absolutely don't mess with him. They found a jawbone of a guy that was six and a half inches from TMJ to TMJ. Here we go again, more hoaxes. Anyone who would like a detailed analysis on these lies merely needs to Google the reference, and you'll find several articles that explain exactly how the photoshopping took place. We could, like, fit that over our jaws. Huge. You know, the Bible tells us there were giants in the earth in those days. You know what I believe? There were giants in the earth in those days. That's exactly right. Now, not only were people living longer and growing bigger, animals lived longer and grew bigger before the flood. And there's lots of evidence to support this as well. They found a fossilized hornless rhinoceros that was 18 feet tall. What you're referring to is a paratheracerium, which is related to the modern-day rhino, but they are not the same animal. That's a big rhino. Hey, with the, with the conditions the way they were before the flood, with the canopy of water surrounding the atmosphere, giving us more atmospheric pressure, insects could get a whole lot bigger. Because insects can only get so big based on the atmospheric pressure. Because they breathe through their skin. Well, I wonder how big insects could get before the flood. Check out this fossil. It is a fossil dragonfly. You say, who cares we got those today? This one happens to have a 50-inch wingspan. How'd you like to hit that at 70 miles an hour? <laughs> Take the bug deflector and the hood right off, man. Wow, that's going to be a problem. You guys got cockroaches around here, right? They have found fossilized cockroaches 18 inches long. Ladies, what do you do when you find one of those in the kitchen? That's going to be bad, okay? They've discovered fossilized centipedes eight feet long. Huge centipedes have been discovered. Fossil grasshoppers two feet long have been discovered. Fossilized cattails 60 feet tall have been discovered. Yes, most of these insects were much larger in the past. However, this is millions of years ago, not thousands of years ago. Oxygen levels from 6,000 years ago were roughly the same as they are today. Hovind, however, wants to use these fossils as evidence for the Bible, so he constructed a bullshit story about a canopy of water surrounding the earth that increased atmospheric pressure just enough to bloat insects and plants with oxygen. 
I say insects and plants because organisms that don't directly consume the oxygen don't grow freakishly large with oxygen input. A fossil donkey was discovered in Texas that was nine feet tall at the shoulder. Whoa. I was unable to find any original article that discusses this donkey, and so I must conclude that its existence is a myth. Buffalo horns have been found where the span of the horns from tip to tip was 12 feet. Big buffalo. These horns are supposedly in the custody of a Mr. Don Patton, who was a creation scientist. He has never written an account of these horns in any peer-reviewed paper, and so his story is just that. A story, until it becomes available to the scientific community. Fossilized beavers have been discovered eight feet long. This ancient ancestor to the modern-day beaver was, like with the rhino-like creature, not the same species as its modern-day counterpart. Huge beavers have been discovered. Here's a beaver's jaw. They say this beaver had to be seven to eight feet long. Big beaver. Well, that's because they had big trees. So they needed big beavers to chew those trees down. I believe fish got a little bit bigger before the flood. They would have gotten a lot bigger. You know, they say you can tell how big a shark is based on its teeth. If you find a shark's tooth that is one inch long, that represents 12 to 15 feet worth of shark. Well, in that case, I wonder how big this one was. How about that one? I'm going to summarize Eric's argument from here. He's going to claim that every freakishly large animal that ever lived is proof of there being a canopy of water above the earth. We know that there is no evidence to substantiate this claim, and we know that the reason these animals were so large was because millions of years ago, the atmospheric pressure was higher, and oxygen was in greater abundance per cubic unit. Some of the animals that Hoven demonstrates are legitimate examples of this oxygen-imposed growth. Others are animals that look like modern-day animals, but are actually ancient relatives. And some of the animals that he presents do not exist at all. His entire claim, however, rests on the assumption that the Earth had a canopy of water above it 6,000 years ago. But as I and many others have demonstrated, this simply is not physically possible. Hey, reptiles have a very interesting characteristic. You know, reptiles never stop growing. They grow throughout their entire life. People, when we reach a certain age, we stop growing. At least vertically. Some continue horizontally long after that, but... Uh, we stop growing. Reptiles never stop growing. I wonder what some reptiles would look like if you put them back in the Garden of Eden. Let them live to be eight or nine hundred years old if they never stop growing. I bet you would have yourself a big lizard. A terrible lizard. You know the word dino Sore means terrible lizard. Interesting. You think that's where the dinosaurs came from? Is it possible the dinosaurs were just big lizards that lived in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve? Check this Jackson chameleon out. You can buy him in a pet store today. It's a lizard that has three horns on his head. What would he look like at about uh, 800 years old and a couple of tons? A triceratops, that's exactly right. Eric, you're assuming that reptiles used to live for hundreds of years, which we know was never the case. Secondly, lizards and dinosaurs are not the same animals at all. Many dinosaurs contained avian characteristics like hollow bones, and some probably even had feathers. Saying that a lizard can eventually grow into a dinosaur makes about as much sense as saying that a goldfish can grow into a whale. This oversimplification of zoology speaks volumes about you, Eric. People say, that's ridiculous. Dinosaurs and man never lived together. Well, they find their bones buried right next to each other. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. That ought to give us a pretty good clue. Look, guys, before the flood, the world was a different place. When God originally made this world, it was, it was really, really good at one time. Some people that look at our world today, and they're looking at a wrecked creation a ruined creation, and they're going, how could God make this? God's going, I didn't make it that way. I didn't make all the, the death and suffering. I didn't do that. Remember, what brought death and suffering into this world? Sin did. 
By man came death. Yeah, in Adam all die. Sin is what caused that. Darwin had a problem with this. Darwin wrote, I am bewildered. I had no intention to write atheistically, but there seems to be so much misery in the world. Darwin looked at the world today. Looked at what's going on today and said, I can't believe in a God that would make that. And God's response is, I didn't make it that way. Now wait just a fucking second. Let's assume for a moment that your God is real. Is God not omniscient? Does he not know everything that will ever happen? And when he set events into motion the way he did, did he not foresee what would come of his creation? Why did he not choose to create a reality in which suffering did not come into the world? He had a choice. He knew the consequences of setting events into motion in this manner. He knew, before he even created the world the way he did, how things would turn out. So ultimately, who is responsible for suffering in the world? This is one of the biggest reasons that the mere premise of your God is logically inconsistent. When I made it, when I first did it, in the beginning, it was, it was very, very good. Thank you for joining us tonight. I look forward to session four. But for tonight, remember, originally, it was, it was good. Thank you. Have a good night. Rate, comment, and subscribe, and let me know if you want me to follow him into session four.